Jordan Chattel is the executive director of the Medical Education Institute, headquartered in Wisconsin, where one of her primary functions is to pursue opportunities for collaborative research, outreach, and evidence-based educational materials development to support improved outcomes in chronic disease, particularly kidney disease. She has been, or is a current member, of a number of committees that provide expertise to dialysis professionals and educational materials to dialysis patients, which help to improve quality of care. She is a prolific presenter with well over 100 presentations on a variety of topics, including, but not limited to, sexuality and fertility, dialysis modality choice, home therapies, body image, overcoming needle fear, and disease self-management. Also, she has participated in several research studies, gathering the data from nephrology professionals and kidney patients regarding professional training, professional and patient experiences, and communicating dialysis modality choices. Lastly, Ms. Chattel is an author, a co-author, an editor, a presenter, or a producer of copious professional and patient education publications and multimedia materials. Her contributions include book chapters, articles, blog posts, and presentations. In February 2015, she was awarded Special Recognition Award from the Annual Dialysis Conference for Achievements in Patient Education. And she is the co-author of the book, Help, I Need Dialysis, How to Have a Good Future with Kidney Disease. Welcome, Ms. Dory Chattel. Hello. I figured this out in just one second. Well, saw the San Andreas Fault. <laughs> I would really appreciate it if everything would just stay very still, at least until I leave. <laughs> That's not too much to ask, right? Hopefully not. All right, so um, Christy obviously read my entire CV, and I'm actually really impressed with myself now. I can just go home. <laughs> But um, our mission, I was actually struck when, when Christy was speaking because the mission of the Medical Education Institute is so very much like the mission of BAKP. Our mission is to help people with chronic disease learn to manage and improve their health. And our focus is kidney disease. So MEI is sort of an umbrella, if you will, over... Is it just me or is this microphone kind of kicking in and out? You can't hear that? I'm going to ignore it then. Okay, so MAI is an umbrella over a lot of different projects that we do, many of which I will tell you about at the end because they're resources for you and they are free. And we also sent some copies of that book, Help I Need Dialysis, so I believe that everybody here will get to take one home. So some background before we leap into better dialysis. And Christy asked the question I was going to ask, which is, you know, how many people have chronic kidney disease? How, how many folks have chronic kidney disease and are not on dialysis? Okay, several. All right, I rearranged these slides a little bit, and I'm really glad I did because I kind of had you all in mind. So something important to remember is that finding out that your kidneys are not working as well as they could is like having your own personal tsunami. It is a crisis in your life. It is very scary. It is something that you can get through. And I have talked to probably 15,000 different people with kidney disease in my life, uh, in my work life, and a whole lot of them are doing really well and they're having good lives. So this is scary and it's a crisis, but it's something that you can live with and it's something that you can live well with. And that's what I want to help you to see. So it's completely normal to have a lot of strong emotions associated with kidney problems, you know, with finding out that you have kidney problems. It's completely normal to be scared. 
It's completely normal to be depressed. It's totally normal to be angry. Who might you be angry with? You might be angry with yourself. If you um, knew that you had a problem that you know, maybe you didn't deal with it the way the doctor had wanted you to, it's normal to be angry at your doctor if your doctor missed a problem or caused a problem. And some people are even angry at God, and that's a, a difficult place to be. Kidney disease is not a punishment. It happens to good people. It happens to all sorts of different people. So I just wanted to, to help you to, to realize that if you have a lot of strong feelings, that is totally, totally normal. The choice that you do make about which treatment to do affects every aspect of your life, though. So I am really passionate about helping people to find the treatment option that makes their lives work the way that they want them to. So it can affect what you eat, what you drink, how many different medications you might take, how easy or difficult it is to travel, how easy or difficult it is to work, and it can affect sexuality and fertility if you're young enough to want to have a child. So all of these things are important, and knowing what's important to you so that you can make a match that will make your life work the way you want to is really the first step. And we don't usually look at it as the first step. Usually we tell people about the options. But we actually prefer to start with your values. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. One of the most important things you can do is to learn as much as you can. And that's why I'm really glad to see a whole room full of people who are learning. It's great that you're here. This is a scary topic if you're not somebody who is on dialysis yet. It takes a lot of guts to show up in a room and learn more about it. So I commend you. You're doing the right thing. I wish everybody would do this thing. And, and too many don't. There's another important thing, and that is reframing, if you will. And that's uh, something to the effect of one life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Reframing is looking at a situation in a different way. Things can happen. Things happen to all of us. Maybe things that we don't want to have happen. happen. And we, we don't necessarily have a choice about what those are. But as Viktor Frankl, who's a, a famous psychiatrist and a Holocaust survivor, said, the last of the human freedoms is to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. So we don't always get a choice about the things that happen in our lives, the good things or the bad things, but we always have a choice about how we react to them, how we frame them. And you can see my frame around this quote. So we can look at things in a different way. If you look at this picture, you might see a bunny. You might see a duck. This picture is both a bunny and a duck at the same time. It's a bunny duck. <laughs> but you know, the, the point here is that you can look at the same picture, and you can see actually three different things, the bunny, the duck, and the bunny duck. And there are very few things that we would look at and only be able to see one thing. There's always more than one interpretation, maybe three. And here's another example I think is kind of cute. What you might think is happening in this picture is that this, this fellow is kind of proud that he's lost a lot of weight. But actually, when you read the caption, it says, oh, he didn't lose any weight. He just bought bigger pants. <laughs> right? It's a different way of looking at that same situation. And that's something that is a very powerful tool to help cope when things go in your life in a way that you didn't expect or want them to. You have the power to reframe. You have the power to look at things in a different way. And the downward comparison is what we call it when you look at people who are maybe not as well off as you are and you think, okay, this thing happened to me, this kidney disease, but I have all, all my limbs and I can walk around. This is Nick uh, Wojcik, and he, I'm actually not pronouncing his name right. It's, I think it's Serbian originally. He's from, he was born in Australia with a rare condition in which he was born with no arms or legs. And he had, a, as you can imagine, a very difficult childhood. He was bullied a lot, and he was even suicidal at one point. But now he's a motivational speaker. And I don't know how many of you are, are people with faith. Are you people with faith? Well, what he says is something to the effect of, if God can use me 
With no arms or legs to be his hands and feet, he certainly can use any willing heart. And so he's, he is a motivational speaker, he speaks around the world, and he is actually having a really good life. This is his wife, this is his second baby, they have two sons now. So nothing is impossible, and depending on how you look at things, you know, you can make out of a life, even when it seems very difficult, you can have a good life. This is a little bit of history that I like to always ensure that people know when their kidneys don't work and they need dialysis because I was born in February of 1960, okay, so 56 and a half years ago. In March of 1960, the first chronic dialysis started in Seattle. So within my lifetime, there, there wasn't any dialysis before that. So folks who had chronic kidney failure, they didn't have any choices to live. And today we do. And that's really, really important. A lot of diseases out there now still don't have any options for treatment. This one does. And not only are there options, but there are a bunch of options. So what's the best option? These are, by the way, all pictures of people who are about the same age. And you can see that they're in sort of very different health status, very different stages of life. So some people of the same age can be very active and can be out there still working, still doing things. And some are playing chess in the park and some are taking care of grandkids. Everybody is different. And the best option is the option that lets your life work the best and it lets you feel as well as you can. So dialysis, it does two major things. It removes extra water when your kidneys don't work. And we're gonna talk about that a lot, so I'm actually not gonna belabor that right this second. And it also removes toxins. And interestingly, in the short run, how somebody feels on dialysis is almost 100% about the water removal. In the longer run, it's about the toxins. So, the toxin that we tend to look at is something called urea, blood urea, nitrogen, or BUN, and that's protein waste that builds up in the blood, and we measure it because it's cheap and it's easy to measure. But in terms of actually assessing how good dialysis is, it's actually not really a very good measure. The problem is urea is a tiny little rounded molecule. It's very small and it's very easy to remove versus what we call middle molecules, something like beta-2 microglobulin. This actually causes long-term complications with things like arthritis and joint pain and, and um, bone issues. And you can see that's a much larger molecule and it's also very twisty and just very difficult to get through the pores in a membrane. So the adequacy measure that's used in the field is something that isn't really based on what matters the most. What matters much more is how you feel. So I hear a lot of people who say, well, my, my labs are great, but I feel terrible. The labs don't matter that much. How you feel matters more. So KTO review, for one thing, it doesn't measure water, and water is very important. And adequate Adequate's about a grade of a D, if you think about it, right? It's just enough to not fail. Adequate is not good. So we want to tell you how to be better than adequate. Good dialysis helps keep your whole body in balance. That's what kidneys do. The job of kidneys at the end of the day is homeostasis. They keep all of your body chemistries within a constant tight range all the time. And so when that balance fails, then all sorts of things start going haywire. But what we want is we want everything to be as level as possible. There are seven different ways to do dialysis. Unfortunately, often people are still not told that there are all of these different ways. Sometimes people are only told that they can go to a center three times a week. And sometimes they're only told about the center dialysis, and maybe also peritoneal dialysis. But there are all these other ways. So peritoneal dialysis can be done in two ways. It can be done with a cycler machine at night, or it can be done as manual 
exchanges of fluid during the day, and I'll show you that on the next slide, what that looks like. And then in center, there are two different ways to do dialysis. There's what I call standard, which is you go three times a week for like three or four hours. Is anybody doing that? Mm -hmm. Okay, not too many people in this room. You're, normally, you would be in the majority, and here you're not. But um, that's the most common across the country. That's the most common treatment that people do. But also in the center, people can go at night, and they can do three treatments a week at night. Is anybody doing that? Excellent. Okay, that's twice as much dialysis. It's twice as many hours of treatment, and it's much more gentle. And then at home, there are three different ways to do hemodialysis. Is anybody doing hemodialysis at home? Okay, so at least one person. So there's three different ways. You can do a standard schedule of three times a week, or you can do short daily, which is usually five or six days a week, or you can do it at night while you sleep, and that can be every other day. It can be four nights, five nights, six nights. And uh, the home dialysis, home hemo, is usually done on this smaller machine. It's a little bit more portable. It still weighs 100 pounds when you put it in a travel case, so you, know, you can't like put it in your pocket or anything, but it is smaller. It is possible to change treatments. If you try one and you're not liking how it works, you can change. And often people don't know that either. So it's not um, necessarily the case that if you start one treatment, you're kind of stuck on it. And here's my picture of peritoneal dialysis. So you can see the catheter and how she's covered the exit site with a bandage. And then that goes into the peritoneum, which is the lining of the inside of the belly. And that can be used as sort of a sack to fill up with sterile fluid. And the wastes and the water flow into that fluid. And then you drain that out. And then you replace it with fresh fluid. And that can be done with either a machine at night. So your days can be free, depending on how much kidney function you still have left. Or people may have to do one exchange during the day and then also do this at night. But it's very gentle, it's very easy to learn and easy to do. Any type of self-care treatment option is going to put you in the driver's seat. It's going to give you more flexibility of your schedule. It's going to give you more control, and it's probably going to give you more choices as far as what you can eat, what you can drink, where you can be, how you can travel, whether you can keep a job, all of those things. They're just all going to be easier if you're doing it yourself. And some people do self-care in center. That's an option, too, for some folks. This is my friend Harvey. He's since had a kidney transplant. But here he is dialyzing out by the beach. He's doing short day chemo with his next stage machine. And you know, with that view, it doesn't look quite so bad. I would be pretty happy with that view. So here is sort of how the doses of dialysis lay out. You can see we're starting on the one end with healthy kidneys. The least amount of dialysis that you can get is if you go to a clinic three times a week. That's just not very much treatment. PD is a little tiny bit more because it's continuous, but it's not very efficient. So. It, people would think that it would be a lot more. It's not a lot more. It's just a little bit more treatment. Short daily chemo, that's a little bit more than PD. And people tend to feel better and live longer. In center nocturnal, three nights a week, that is more than short daily. And again, people, the more treatment folks get, the longer they tend to live and the better they feel. But there are some advantages to starting out with PD because it's very gentle and very easy to learn and do. And then nocturnal home hemo, I shouldn't say extended, I should have updated that slide, and transplant. And so the other advantage of any self-care home treatment is it makes you look really good to a transplant program, something to think about. So what we're going to talk about is the seven different ways that you can tell if you're on dialysis, if you're getting good dialysis. So we'll go through these one at a time. And one of them is, you feel good pretty much right after a treatment is over. And that's much more important than you might think, how long it takes you to feel well again after a treatment. It's really important. With PD, usually, it's pretty much right away, because PD is very gentle. With hemo, though, it can be quite a bit different. 
So this was a study of thousands of patients. This is the dialysis outcomes and practice patterns, and I think it's, I can't remember if it's 12 countries or 14 countries, and thousands and thousands and thousands of patients. But this is kind of how they found that it broke out. And they asked people the question, how long does it take you to feel well again after a treatment? And about a third of people felt pretty good two hours or less after their treatment was over. And that's good. And it's color-coded green for a reason. This is stoplight coding. Green is good. Yellow is not as good. Red is definitely not good. And we do not want to be in the gray. So another 41% took them a little bit longer, two to six hours. But they still did OK. That's still kind of a long day. If you come in for a treatment, and it takes four hours, and then it takes you another six hours to feel good. That, that's a pretty good chunk out of your day. But still, they did pretty well. When you got up to seven hours or more, though, people didn't live as long. So how long it takes you to feel good after a treatment is one measure of how long you may live on dialysis. So you want that recovery time to be shorter. And some folks didn't really feel well until the next day. That's definitely a, a danger sign and something that needs to be dealt with. So what we want is to have folks in that two hours or less band, if possible. So why is less recovery time better? Because recovery time less than seven hours, there's less risk of being in the hospital, and people live longer. And why is that? There's two things that tend to cause long recovery time, and I told you we were going to talk more about water, and we are here and then in this next section. So taking off too much water or taking it off too fast, either or both of those things. And here's my race car to remind you of this. We don't want to be racing around taking off our water. So what we're going to do is move on to this next Item, because actually this is where you get the detail about how a water removal works during dialysis. So a second sign of really good dialysis is that water is removed slowly and gently. And here's a question for your blood vessels, and I don't know if your blood vessels are going to answer me, but do your blood vessels want this sort of gentle flow of water like you might get from a garden hose? Or do they maybe want this fire hose? Yeah, I don't think I'm just looking around. It doesn't look like anybody wants that fire hose in their blood vessels. And that's a good instinct on your part because that sort of turbulence, it's hard on the access. It's also hard on the rest of you. So our bodies are 60% water. We are mostly water. And in fact, the dialysis is supposed to clean extra water out of the whole body. But that's kind of hard to get to because Dialysis only reaches the blood, and the blood is only about 8% of total body water. So a man has about 4 liters of blood, a woman may have a little bit less. So if you're going to remove, say, 3 or 4 liters of water at a treatment, and you've only got 4 liters of blood, how does that work? Right? That doesn't make any sense. So this is how it works. We've got cells, we're made out of cells, and most of the water in our body is inside of the cells, or it's in between the cells. And it shifts from one place to another. So it's in the cells, and then it shifts to in between the cells, and then it shifts into the vascular space, the blood vessels. Some of this can happen during treatment. So you start pulling water out of the blood during the treatment, and some water from in between the cells will move into the blood. And then some water from inside the cells will move in between the cells. And it's sort of almost like a waterfall. And that's why I kind of drew it that way. You can sort of see this, this sort of cascade. But the thing is that this takes time. And a four-hour treatment isn't very much time. And some people don't even get four hours. So it can be challenging to shift that water into the blood so you can remove it when you're only doing three treatments a week and they're only about four hours long. We're asking a lot of your blood vessels. And so what we end up with is a lot of what I call fire hose dialysis. And that fast ultrafiltration to try to get that fluid off because there's only three treatments in a week, this is what it tends to do. Folks tend to get 
muscle cramps. Now this is either if the water removal is too fast or too much or both. If it's nice and slow or it isn't too much, this won't happen. But if this does happen, this is why it happens. So you get the muscle cramps. The blood pressure will crash. And then people will feel washed out. That's that long recovery time. If blood pressure crashes, it can take a long time to feel well again. And people will go home and they'll need to drink pickle juice or broth or something, you know, to, to bring their blood pressure back up, which makes no sense because you go to dialysis to remove water and salt and then you add more water and salt. And, you know, that, that's not working. The lack of blood flow when water is pulled out of the blood too fast and there's not enough oxygen carrying blood to sort of make it through the body to all of the tissues, it actually causes tissue damage. It, it starves the, the tissues of oxygen. And this kind of damage is called stunning, myocardial <coughs> stunning in terms of the heart. So you actually can see what they call regional wall abnormalities um, inside of the heart. They've actually dialyzed people inside of PET scans to watch what happens during a treatment. And this sort of damage, it doesn't just happen to the heart, it happens to whatever kidney function is left. That can be stunned, and so that's the reason why when people do standard in center chemo, their residual kidney function, however much they have left, it doesn't last as long as it does with PD or other forms of treatment. It tends to go away faster because the kidneys get stunned. And the brain can get stunned, so that can actually cause some you know, some difficulties with memory and, and things like that. So we don't want to be doing this in a harsh way. We want to be doing dialysis as gently as we can. And obviously gaining less water if you're coming in with a lot to remove is part of the equation. But over time, each time the heart is stunned and there's damage, the body fixes the damage by putting a patch on it. And that patch is fibrosis. And so what you're seeing here is something called left ventricular hypertrophy, LVH. And what that means is that the heart's main pumping chamber has gotten damaged and repaired and damaged and repaired and damaged and repaired. And the problem is that those repairs, that fibrosis, they don't contract the way the real muscle does. It's sort of flabby and weak. And that reduces the ejection fraction of the heart. There's not as much space inside of the heart to push blood out and there's not as strong of contractions, and that can cause heart failure. So fire hose dialysis is not a good thing, and that long recovery time and the blood pressure drops during treatment or even muscle cramps are all signs that that's happening, and you don't want to have that happen. There are things that can be done about it, though, which is important. So if anybody asks questions about this at the end, we'll tell you what those things are. So slow and steady is better. The tortoise is better than the hare in this case. And the rate of ultrafiltration or pulling water out, that's really important. So we want to be pulling out less than 10 milliliters of water per hour per kilo of body weight. So if you weigh 75 kilos, you don't want to be pulling more than uh, you know what? I can't do that math, but it's okay. We built a tool to help you. This is the chart. This is the graph. If you like to look at graphs, you can see in that green band that that's less than 10, and then 10 to 13 is in the yellow. That's what Medicare is looking at right now as their standard. They're looking at possibly saying that dialysis clinics for standard treatments should not be removing more than 13 mils per hour per kilo. But we built this handy tool. You may want to write this one down because this is so new. Or I guess you have my slides. Never mind. You have this. You have this URL. We just built this, and it's new, and it's free. And if somebody does any sort of hemodialysis, this is a handy tool to see what your ultrafiltration rate is. And you want that rate to be in the green, if possible. Or if you're Medicare, you want it to be at least in the yellow. But if your rate is in the green, then that at least means that you are not pulling water too quickly. It doesn't necessarily mean that you are pulling the correct amount. That's trickier to figure out. But it's still really important to at least not do it too fast. Because if you don't pull it too fast, you don't get that stunning injury. The other way to prevent injury from stunning is to have the dialysate fluid a little bit cooler. 
So if it's half a degree centigrade, cooler than your body temperature, it helps to prevent stunning. So it's good to know they can do that in the clinic. A third way to know if your dialysis is good is you don't need blood pressure pills to control your blood pressure. And that almost sounds like heresy. Does every single person on dialysis take blood pressure pills? Actually, with really good dialysis, the first thing you throw out is blood pressure pills, and the second thing you throw out is the binders. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So the pill burden on standard in center hemo is actually the highest of any disease. It is half of people take 19 pills a day. But you know, at least you get to do it with a fluid limit. So I'm not quite sure how that works. But yeah, that's practically lunch, 19 pills a day. And it's tricky to take that many pills, especially with fluid women. But it's tricky because there are some good databases about how any two medications interact with each other. But once you get beyond two, nobody knows. If you take three pills, if you take four, you take five, there's no way to know how those might react together. And so taking fewer you know, is always sort of a happier thing than taking more. And then, of course, you have to pay for those pills, and some of them can be really expensive. So less is more. With blood pressure, it's tricky. High blood pressure can cause kidney failure, but high blood pressure can also result from kidney failure. So we don't necessarily know which came first, but either way, better dialysis once the kidneys do fail can mean not necessarily needing blood pressure pills to keep blood pressure in control. Every single thing that could possibly happen has happened. <laughs> Every single thing. It's like, oh, okay, no problem. We'll just restart. There we go. And there. Right? Yes, that's much better. All right, so the different types of dialysis that you can do, they really do have an impact on blood pressure and the number of pills that you need. So folks who do PD, they do tend to start out needing fewer meds, and then over time they may need more. And that can be a sign that PD is starting to not work as well. It will not work forever. And so needing more meds is, is a sign that would be worth paying attention to. Short daily chemo, folks tend to need significantly fewer blood pressure meds. And with nocturnal, I'm not so sure about nocturnal. In center, three times a week, you may still need the, the meds because there's four nights where you're not getting the treatment. But folks who do nocturnal home chemo, they don't need any blood pressure medicines because their treatment is doing all of that work for them. Calcium is only where it belongs. Now, we really want calcium to only be where it belongs, and where it belongs is in your bones and in your teeth and a little tiny bit in your blood, but that little tiny bit is very critical and it has to be at the right level. Calcium is an electrolyte, and an electrolyte dissolves into ions in when it's, um, the substance is dissolved in water, or in this case, your blood. And calcium has a lot of, serves a lot of purposes in the body. It helps your blood clot, and it helps your nerves talk to your muscles, and it's important. But it also, it's in a lot of different places. It's in foods that you eat, primarily dairy foods, but also leafy greens. But the thing is, it can go where you don't want it. When, you, when your phosphorus levels are too high and your calcium levels are too high at the same time, you basically can get bone forming where you don't want bone, or in this case, calcification, here in an artery. You don't want your arteries calcified. You want your bones calcified. And you know the ironic thing is your, your arteries calcify and then your bones get weak because they lose the calcium. So it's really important to keep it where it should be. And that's something that good dialysis can do. It can help maintain bone mineral balance so that everything stays where it's supposed to and it doesn't go all over the place where you don't want it. And you don't need phosphate binders. Phosphorus is in even more foods than calcium. It's in a lot of foods. It's in basically most of the foods that you would really want to eat that are healthy, that have fiber in them. You know, the foods that if you have diabetes, your doctor wants you eating. These are all the foods that have phosphorus in them. 
you know, you're supposed to be limiting if you don't um, get a lot of dialysis. Not the Coca-Cola, actually, nobody needs Coca-Cola. Nobody. And phosphorus and potassium are both at this point added to a lot of processed foods and processed food, phosphorus and maybe potassium is absorbed 100% whereas phosphorus from natural sources like beans and dairy and meat is only absorbed, I can't remember if it's 40% or 60%, but it's considerably less. So it's really important to read food labels and look for the word you know, phosphate, something phosphate, triphosphate, whatever. It's usually a big long word that no, you're not sure what it is. That's a good sign to avoid that food because it's not really a food. This is what happens in the body with phosphorus. And you can see those three yellow bars at the bottom of that graph. Those are the three days a week that dialysis is happening in a center. And so this is a standard dialysis graph. And those are the only times that phosphorus is being removed. But the problem is it's being eaten at every meal. And so what you end up with at the end of even one week is an increase in net phosphorus because you're having the treatments and it's removing some, but it can't keep up. And that's what the binders are for, to try to help keep up. But PD removes 10% more phosphorus than standard chemo, probably because it's going on all the time. Phosphorus is a small molecule, but it has a jacket of water around it that makes it harder to remove. So the longer treatment time that you get with peritoneal dialysis removes more phosphorus than standard chemo does. Short daily chemo, most people need fewer binders, but sometimes that can be a wash because People tend to feel better when they get more chemo and then they eat more phosphorus and so then they may need binders after all. Nocturnal chemo removes so much phosphorus that people may actually need supplements instead of binders. So it's way more dialysis. Healthy nerves. If folks on dialysis have neuropathy and they don't have diabetes, then the neuropathy could be caused by not getting enough dialysis. And this happens a lot, and I hear it a lot from patients. That's not the only cause, but it's certainly something to be suspicious of if somebody gets neuropathy and doesn't have diabetes. And diabetes obviously is its own cause for neuropathy, and I don't know that dialysis is gonna help it. There are a lot of medications for it, but not a lot of cures. So sleep, how well you sleep. A lot of folks have sleep issues on dialysis, almost on any type of dialysis, but better sleep is linked with gentle dialysis. This fellow does not seem like he's getting any sleep. That baby is also not getting any sleep. Is that like one bright-eyed, bushy-tailed baby or what? Hi, Dad. Yeah. All right, so we have lots of resources for you. This is a decision aid, or this is a postcard to show you how our decision aid works. This is mydialysischoice.org. And what we've done is we've built a tool that lets folks choose a type of dialysis based on what's important to you. So there are 24 different lifestyle and health and relationship values, and I would suggest that you choose three or four of them, although if you actually want to choose every single one of them, you're welcome to do that. It's just that it takes about five minutes for each one you pick, and you'll be there for about two hours. But, you know, I mean, two hours, that's not that much time to invest in what the rest of your life, or at least a good chunk of it, might look like. So it, it may be worth it. So you can do that, and, um, and then for each value you pick, you're going to see four different boxes that contain the seven different ways of doing dialysis, and you can rate each of those with stars. They've got pros and cons for that type of dialysis, but just for that value. And then at the end, you see a chart that shows you what your values are and how many stars you gave things. So it's completely transparent, and it, try it. You know, it works on an iPhone or, I mean, it works on a phone or a, sorry, I was going to say a smartphone or a tablet, or you can do it on a computer, and it's free. And then it's based on that Help I Need Dialysis book, so most of the information behind it is in that book. We just built this as an interactive tool to just try to make it a little bit easier to figure out what might fit your life, because that's the hardest part to do. 
Kidney School has 16 different modules on lots of different topics. Each one of them is available as uh, interactive, tailored online information. So you can go through and you can get a personal action plan at the end. Or they're all available as full color, big type PDFs. You can just print them off and read them. Or if you don't feel like reading, you can actually listen to all of the modules. And the PDFs are in English and also in Spanish. And Home Dialysis Central has tons of information about peritoneal dialysis and all of the types of home hemodialysis and in-center nocturnal dialysis, which isn't home, but we weren't exactly going to call it home and or in-center nocturnal dialysis central, because that would have been kind of clunky. So we didn't do that. But there's tons and tons of information on here. And we also have a Facebook group, which I should have put on here too, but if you're on Facebook, Home Dialysis Central on Facebook, and we would love to have you. You are all very welcome. And then this help book, which, you know, should be here somewhere, I think, and everybody can have one, and I hope you read it. We wrote it kind of for all of you. And so some takeaways. It's a crisis to find out that your kidneys are not working and that you need dialysis. And learning is one way that can help you cope, and so is reframing. I should put that on there. There are a lot of ways to see if the treatment that you are getting is good dialysis. And I, you know, I meant to say at the beginning that just even having a title, you know, how to tell if you're getting good dialysis, suggests that there's good dialysis and there's not as good dialysis, and that's true. You know, good dialysis lets you feel well and do the things that matter to you in your life. And if that's not where you are, you can change and you can get some good dialysis. And there are lots of resources to help you. So now I have time for questions. How much time do I have? Many. Lots of time for questions. Lots. lots. I love questions. I'll question myself if you guys don't question me. Watch me. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. Even then I'm going to have quizzes. And I'll be like, OK, you, what did you learn? OK, go ahead. Or do you want to give him a microphone? That'd be great. Yes, we're going to do microphones so that we can take this better. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. What, what is uh, fibrosis? Fibrosis just means that the body is laying down fibers. It's almost like a patch. You know, if you were going to weave a fabric. You might have fibers going one way and then another way. That's kind of what the body does. It's like a scab, only inside, only not something that comes off. It's sort of a permanent scab. Okay. Does that help? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. uh, the other, the other question. I'm not the person. I'm uh, my sister's. Uh, she's 92, and she's been on dials for three years. So I take wow. her. I take her three, uh, three days. I mean, three, yes, three days a week. And I see that she's doing, you know, she's doing well most of the time. But she also has challenges with, you know, she's early demented. And I need to know, this is one of the big issues in our family house. She is a smoker. I mean, a real smoker. What does that mean to you as a, a nephrologist? I'm not a nephrologist. Okay. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. So I don't want to mislead you to think I'm a nephrologist. So what's your experience then? I would say that smoking is something that is definitely associated with, uh, what how do they call that? Hardening of the arteries, including in the brain. You know, does, does your sister have other health issues besides the dementia and the kidney failure? No, her, uh, the only other thing after the, uh, dialysis, what happens with her is her 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 leg hurts. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's it's it, you know on the hip. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that the may other, be from sitting in the chair. Yeah, yeah that's that. What's yeah. happening? But other than that, she's you know dialysis has spared her life. Right. You know, it's um, it's tricky because in the last few years there have been a bunch of studies that have come out that suggest that people who are over 80 and have other illnesses 
don't necessarily live any longer with dialysis than they do without it. So it's not always necessarily the kindest thing to do to keep somebody on dialysis if they aren't necessarily going to live any longer with it. The smoking is really an issue for somebody with dementia because there's a real danger, depending on how her living situation, that she's going to start a fire, you know, that she's going to burn herself up. So that's very scary to hear. Yeah, and yeah, she could burn me up. Um, well, I would certainly not want to see that happen. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but thank you. Yeah. Oh, I see somebody way in the back. There we go. Uh, I had heard that a home dialysis takes, there has to be two people. That depends a lot. It depends on the type. Peritoneal dialysis is a type of home dialysis, and most centers don't have any partner requirement for that. As far as home hemodialysis, it depends on the dialysis provider. There is, Medicare doesn't ever define the role of a home hemodialysis partner. So there's no standard that you must have a partner and this partner must do this, 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 and this. Other countries like Australia, New Zealand, the Netherlands, they not only don't require a partner, they won't train somebody who needs a partner. If you can't do it by yourself, you can't do it at all. So the U.S. is a little bit of a nanny state in some cases when it comes to home hemodialysis. There are a bunch of folks on our Facebook group who self-dialyze. They are, um, they are capable and they are motivated and they don't have a partner and they have worked out with their doctors the ability to do home hemodialysis by themselves. There is some risk of doing that, but there may be more risk of going to a clinic three times a week and not getting very much dialysis. So as an adult, if you have the right to say sign a waiver and jump out of an airplane or smoke cigarettes or you know drive a car or do any of the things that adults are able to do, in my opinion, you should be able to choose to take on that risk if you want to. A lot of people don't want to, but folks who want to should be able to, I think. And some, some clinics will support that. It depends on the clinic. Okay, could you put back the slide titled Kidney Function? Going from least to most. Oh, sure, the one rural arrows. Yeah, let me find that. It's going to be faster to find if I do this. There it is. Okay. Oops. Let's click. Okay, we have arrows for you. Now, what are we supposed to include, conclude from that? with regard to peritoneal dialysis, that it is not very effective? It's not very efficient, and it works best when somebody still has residual kidney function and still makes urine. Most people who start peritoneal dialysis can do it for a couple of years. It doesn't tend to be a long-term treatment option, but I have known people who have been really happy on it for 15 years or 18 years. They tend to be very tiny. It helps to be very small, but it's generally not a long-term option. Where do you find nocturnal? Where do you find nocturnal? Uh, we should be getting online here. About 10% of the clinics in the U.S. are offering home nocturnal. I'm not sure we have great numbers about in-center nocturnal, but this lady does it in this area, so you know better than me. I'm not in this area. Oh, you're not in this area. Okay. Yeah, I go to Modesto. Okay, okay. Yeah, the thing about in-center nocturnal, you're going to want to have to the clinic be somewhere near you because you're going to be going there three times a week. Home nocturnal... I mean, the Northwest Kidney Centers in Seattle follow patients all the way to Alaska and Montana. So if you're home, a clinic can far follow you further, but in center, not so much. There, we have a database on Home Dialysis Central. If you go on the internet, or I can maybe show you on my 
I've had when we're done. We have a place where you can look up where the clinics are that offer each kind of treatment, and so we can see what's around here. Would gentlemen here have a comment about that? Sure. Yeah, I, I, if you're in Modesto doing nocturnal in the center, you're probably with satellite. Yes, I am. Okay, so yes, satellite in this area is the only provider for nocturnal in center dialysis. Sure, so I'm hearing satellite is the only provider of in center nocturnal. I'm working on the core curriculum for the dialysis technician right now, and so I just updated some five-year slides of how many in-center nocturnal programs we had, I think, in our database, and it dropped by about 50% in the last five years. So it's, it's harder to find that option, which is too bad. Probably because the clinics have a hard time finding staff who want to work that shift, you know, so that, that's tricky. Yes, that's, that's what, uh, why I do it, that's the problem. There's no other center that does not turn. Right. I think Kaiser has a program. Yeah, well, they subcontract. Yeah, Kaiser doesn't usually have its own clinics. They subcontract to other clinics. Not even this, though. They yeah. Don't. yeah. Satellite is the only one in, in uh, But I've been across the country. I'm, I'm originally from Georgia. And when I travel there, um, there's other units that do not turn. Great. Yeah, they're very nice. I, that was one of the things I liked uh, when I was at home. They actually have beds. You sleep in beds. That is nice. Where in uh, where I go, we sleep in lounge chairs. Which is not necessarily that easy to do. Those, those chairs are not meant for sleeping. They're not. And then, oh, the, yeah, I mean, the plus side of in-center nocturnal is you don't need a partner. You don't have to have a machine in your house. You don't need to do the training. You know, you don't need to do the, the treatment yourself. The month side tends to be that the, the hours can be kind of not great. Like, what time at night do they start? I start, I do from 9 to uh, 5. In the That's night. not bad. 9 to 5 is not bad. I have heard of shifts going from like 7 to 3 or 8 to 4, there which I have people. to say corresponds to nobody's sleep schedule ever. <laughs> well, there are they just scatter us, and I'm, I'm one of the later patients that come in. Okay. But so they have a range. And you look like you want to say something? Well, uh, it's, it's, it, it, it depends on the individual. I mean, for mm -hmm. my wife and I, for example, for 50 years, our work schedules have been essentially swing shift and late because mm -hmm. we're in, in, involved in the arts. So for me to get on at 6 o'clock and off at 2.30 is not that far from my normal working hours. Oh, good. And I think that on average you would find that more than you might expect just on raw numbers. Because Maybe. Not well, <laughs> our patients are not serving very often. Yeah. We have very poor contact with the social workers, if any. We have very poor contact with, with uh, management, if any. Sure. And as a result, nobody knows what's going on. Yeah, the social worker never wants to come in on your shift. Uh -huh. yeah. They don't come in on my shift. Do they? Yeah. Wow, oh, that's yeah. great. You know, in Canada, though, and other countries where they do in center nocturnal, the shift tends to be from 10 or 11 at night until 6 or 7 in the morning, which is a little more yeah. typical. Yeah, they're very, um, cool. they, they work with us very well. Our dietitian comes in, and I, uh, the social worker comes in once a month, and uh, the doctors actually come in. That's great. Yeah, yeah they work with us very well. Uh, but but my, my question was, um, when you were talking about the removal of the excess fluid, um, why are the nurses pushing all the time to have people take excess? They're always wanting to challenge, challenge, challenge. And even with the nocturnal people, they're cramping all the time because they're wanting to remove so much. Dry weight, it, which is how much fluid needs to be removed, is still more art than science. And until we get to the point where we are using technology to figure out how much extra water is there in the blood, how much extra water is there in the body, we're always guessing. And there are some symptoms that you can go by. I mean, if somebody's having trouble breathing, if they've got pitting edema, you know, you can push into their leg and the dent stays there, you know that they've got extra fluid on board. But if not, and particularly at night, um, that's really unfortunate because you're pulling so much more, even, you know, even if you're running slow. 
I think maybe we need some more nursing education about how to tell when someone's fluid overloaded and how much challenging to do. And I was on the committee, or I, was, I wasn't on the committee, but I observed the, the Dialysis Outcomes and Quality Initiative when they were putting the guidelines together for adequate hemodialysis. I was in that room, and the doctors were talking about how you challenge the patient you know, for, to see if they had reached dry weight by making them crash, essentially by stunning them. And we still do that today. That is still common practice. We're going to stun you until we then we back off a little bit, and that's how we tell you whether you're a dry weight. That's ridiculous. There is, there is technology, you know, bioimpedance assessment technology that could be done. The problem at this point is that it's kind of challenging to interpret the results. It takes a lot of training. Training costs money. The equipment costs money. You know, so it's money. But we can, we can figure out the rate to remove water, but the amount is a different challenge, and it's still a challenge. So we're not quite there yet. But, you know, I do encourage you to join our Facebook group because we have a group of folks who are really, really knowledgeable about PD, about all of the types of home hemo. We've got nephrologists, we've got nurses, we've got social workers, we've got the whole group of folks. And there's some great questions. I mean, folks will really answer the questions. Um, PD, I would say, do PD while you feel good on PD. As long as you feel good on PD, then PD is probably working for you. If you start to drag, if you start to have trouble breathing, if you start to swell up, if you have no energy, I see people failing on PD who don't want to switch away from PD because they hate chemo. And you don't want to, you don't want to be failing on PD. I couldn't do PD because I, my vision is very, I, I, I had a guy beta retinopathy, so I, I can't see very well. Sure. So I, I um, this, the, the second best was the nocturnal. Yeah. So when I was able to get into the nocturnal, I, yeah. I do that. Well, and I know folks who do nocturnal, you know, and have done PD, and they say if they could keep doing PD, they would keep doing PD. They loved PD. It was so comfortable and it was so easy, but it stopped working for them. Yeah, I, I don't, my, if my vision was better, I would have done the PD. I, 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 um, there are assist devices for PD. Did they talk to you about that at all? No. There are assist devices to help people with low vision do PD. It is, it is possible to do it. I've even known of people who have no vision at all who've done it, although I do not quite know how. But I also know people with no vision who have managed to self cannulate. And I haven't figured that out either. There are some very motivated people out there, but you know, it's, it's a risky thing to do. I, I think your decision made sense. Yeah. yeah. And it has to work for you. It, well, this works. It really does. And I really like it. I feel good. Um, my days are free. And I, I, right. I like it a lot. How long have you been on it? Um, almost two two years now. Wow, great. Yeah, I've been doing the, the, the nocturnal. I did the, the day before, mm -hmm. the, you know, the three times. Three sure. Days. And um, my recovery time was quite a while. Okay. I, and are, are you on the transplant list? Yes. The kidney pancreas transplant list? Yes. Good. Yeah, yeah that's usually less of a weight when you eat two organs. Then they could just need one. Yeah, they, they automatically um, say, you know, I qualify for both right. the pancreas because of the diabetes. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, I just saw a hand over there, too. I, I was on the PD dialysis for two years, and I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And uh, I like to travel. Travel all the way from Alaska to all the Caribbean islands, including Australia and New Zealand. Wow. It was so convenient. But after two years, it got infected. Yeah. So I had to switch to chemo. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I was on hemodialysis for two years, and luckily I got transplanted two organs kidney and pancreas. Wow. Uh, nice, but I just completed my 12th year of transplant. Fantastic. I have a friend who got a kidney pancreas transplant, I think, 24 years ago. Um, he had to have the, 
He had to have the, the pancreas um, remodeled. If you, it had to be moved from one place to another. It kept, it kept working, but they had to move it. But, but for starters, people that don't on the, you know, you don't want to be shot with chemo, but PD would be a good starter. Absolutely. It is a great first treatment yeah, option. I kept my work. I mean, I did my daily work. Nobody knew that I was on the dialysis. Right. Uh, so, but if you didn't get infected, I would have stayed on the PD. Yeah. Yeah. How long were you on PD a day? Eight hours, nine hours? Yeah, well, about eight hours every night, seven nights a week. Yeah, and cyclers are pretty portable. The newest Baxter cycler only weighs about 20 pounds. It is the littlest cycler yet. The Amia? At one time I was traveling to Australia, and when they saw the machine, they said, what kind of gadget are you taking? And it had to go to the security system and all that, and it got damaged. So my trip was cut short. Hmm. And, uh, they wouldn't send you out a new one? The company so wouldn't send you out a new one? I was in Australia at that time. The only Australian company had a different cycle. Was that a Baxter cycler, by the way, or a yes, Fresenius cycler? Yeah, Fresenius, I just learned, um, will not ship cycler fluid to other countries because there's a difference in the way that the machines work. So they will ship the manual bags, but they won't ship the cycler bags which limits some folks. I wondered if that was true, Baxter. And you had a question. About three weeks ago, I ate um, at the Jewish Community Center in San Francisco, two or three meals, and I didn't realize that all kosher meat was cured with salt. Ooh. And since then, my water has been more out of control. I mean, it's, I still haven't got rid of it yet. Oh, it's too bad. But I'm you, still working. You, you might be able to ask for an extra treatment just to get rid of that extra water rather than trying to play catch up with three treatments a week. If it's just sort of a one time thing like that and you're catching up, often they will let you do one more treatment. Yeah. Something I'm to ask Davida, about. I'm at Davida in San Francisco who now goes to all four shifts. Is it four? Three shifts. Mm -hmm. So they're going 24 hours a day, but the thing is they don't have any room right now. Yeah, but they would be able to get you into a different location even just for one treatment. That's a possibility. Yeah. Okay, are we running low on time? Okay, we have used up our time, but now we have a panel, right? Yeah. I will let Christy, our MC, announce the panel. Thank you so much.